Welcome, everyone, to the AA. Uh, I think I'll just give a very brief lecture to, uh, for David, and then um, I think the lecture is going to be about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we can take maybe 20 or 30 minutes of questions as well following. Uh, so uh, at, this is actually the eighth and final session uh, of the lecture series and work, series of workshops uh, with Yonsei University and Seoul, a collaboration between uh, the AA and Yonsei University. Uh, I'm Brendan Carlin. Uh, I've co-organized the event along with James Kwang Ho Chung and uh, Jae Won Yi and Jun Sung at, uh, at Yonsei University. And this entire event is funded by the, by the British Council. Um, David Wengro is a professor of comparative archaeology at the Institute of Archaeology at the UCL, University College London. Uh, he's been a visiting professor at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts and at the universities of Auckland and Freiburg. Uh, he's the author of four books, including What Makes Civilization, The Origin of Monsters, and the international bestseller, of course, uh, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity, uh, of course, co-authored with uh, the late David Graeber. Uh, we, we invited uh, David because really for the past seven years in our design studio, Diploma 19, here at the AA, uh, we've been referencing his archaeological and anthropological work. Uh, we think the work is really crucial uh, for architecture today because by, in a sense, excavating new histories, uh, his work opens up possibilities for very different futures and I would say probably more precisely very different presents in a way. Um, David's work exposes, I would say, and suspends many of the dominant histories we often don't even recognize in a sense we've absorbed. Uh, and sort of as architects and cultural producers, it means that we often end up kind of automatically or unknowingly reproducing a dominant reality and as, in a sense perpetuating our trap uh, in crisis. Uh, but his work also gives us, uh, in a, in, on an optimistic note, also gives us architects access to a kind of archive of strange and exciting uh, forms of art, architecture, politics, and life, uh, and, and different ways of imagining and creating the world, I would say. Uh, it reminds us that we really, we have no fixed destiny, nature, or politics. Uh, we, we can have and will uh, shape very different and more interesting realities. Uh, so thanks for all of that work, David, and, and welcome to the AA. Thanks so much, Brendan. Thank you for this invitation. Um, I'm just coming straight out of class up the road at UCL, um, so my, my brain is a little frazzled, so I, I've made notes uh, to help me. Um, I want to just start by saying this, uh, what I'm going to present um, is, is really just the, the beginning uh, of a discussion. Uh, which started quite recently with forensic architecture, and in particular with Eyal Weizmann. Uh, Eyal tells me that he actually was here quite recently uh, giving a talk, so he didn't want to overstretch your hospitality by, uh, by coming again quite so soon. Um, and it's very important for me to acknowledge the, uh, the work of my colleagues, my archaeologist colleagues, John Chapman, Bissaka, Gaidaska, Marco Nebia and Sasha Diachenko, who, uh, whose original field work and research, uh, everything I'm gonna talk about today is really based on that. Um, so here we go. Um, here we go. The remote history of the countries uh, around the Black Sea is awash with gold, gold. At least any casual visitor to the major museums of Safia, Tbilisi, or indeed Kiev could be forgiven for leaving with that impression. Ever since the days of Herodotus, outsiders to the region have come home full of lurid tales about the lavish funerals of warrior kings, the mass slaughter of horses and human retainers that accompanied them. And over a thousand years later, in the 10th century AD, the traveler, Ibn Fadlan, was telling almost identical stories to impress and titillate his Arab readers. As a result, in the lands around the Black Sea, the term prehistory, or sometimes 
proto-history, has always evoked the legacy of aristocratic tribes and lavish tombs topped with these great earthen mounds and crammed with treasure. Treasure, which attracts looters and archeologists, which commands eye-watering prices at auction, and which now travels the world in equally lavish exhibitions such as those mounted in recent years in the galleries and museums of New York, London, Paris, Berlin, and so on. But it turns out this wasn't the whole story. In fact, magnificent warrior tombs might not even be the most interesting aspect of the region's prehistory. There were also cities. In the fertile fields of central Ukraine, less than a meter beneath the black soil, archeologists in the 1970s began to find evidence of an urban tradition extending back 6,000 years. The first traces were noted from the air when the crops were low by the military topographer K.V. Shishkin. In a pioneering application of new field methods, Soviet and Ukrainian archeologists began adding flesh to the picture outlined by him, not just by excavation, but also by peering gently into the ground with techniques of magnetometry, originally designed to locate unexploded ordnance. In this way, they were able to swiftly cover large areas of ground, and the results were astonishing. Settlement plans of striking coherence began emerging from the ground. During the Cold War, archeologists in Western Europe remained largely oblivious to these findings, and their implications were little discussed. All of this was rapidly changing in the years and decades before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. International teams were active in the region. In one particular location, about one hour's drive east of the city of Uman, archeological prospecting using high precision geomagnetic techniques was exposing magnificently clear images of a site that would make it necessary to rewrite the history of urbanism. On the southern Bug Dnieper Interfluv, near the modern village of Nebelivka, a shallow hilltop was found to contain more than a thousand equally sized domestic buildings arranged in several large circumferences around a mysterious empty center covering an area roughly the size of medieval London. As ancient and as large as the first cities of Mesopotamia, long considered to mark the origins of urban life, the buried settlement at Nebelivka contains no evidence of temples, palaces, central administration, rich burials, or other signs of centralized control or social inequality, often considered typical of early cities. Instead, archeology span reveals a system of neighborhoods, each with a single larger structure, suggesting to some the existence of self-governing districts with assemblies for local decision-making. Apart from their size, I should add, these larger structures are essentially similar to ordinary dwellings, but with accentuated entrances, and they lack the usual evidence for storage and preparation 
of food or other signs of permanent habitation. There is nothing in these buildings to suggest that they housed a political or religious upper class. Chapman and Gaidaska, co-directors of the Nebelivka City Project, note pointedly, and I quote, that those expecting the architectural and artifactual reflections of a hierarchical society with elites ruling over thousands of inhabitants in the Tripilia megasites will be disappointed. And that the so-called mega structures, these larger buildings have, and I quote again, none of the depositional characteristics of a ritual or administrative center, but rather of meeting spaces that were used intermittently for larger gatherings within each of the urban districts. Nebelivka and associated sites of what prehistorians call the Tripilia culture manifest high levels of creativity in domestic material culture. This is a, an illustration of one of those larger buildings. And on this map, uh, you can see the proposed reconstruction of those districts. And here is some of that staggeringly beautiful uh, material culture. There are these rich traditions of miniaturism, modeling, and image making. Studies of their economy suggest small-scale cultivation in gardens of cereal crops, sometimes within the bounds of the settlement, combined with the keeping of livestock, the tending of orchards, and a wide spectrum of hunting and foraging activities. The diversity of this prehistoric economy is notable, as is its sustainability. Because another surprising feature of these Ukrainian cities is their light ecological footprint, as exposed through the study of pollen. Pollen sampled from sediment cores in their vicinity. All of this has led to a dispute, an academic dispute about whether these sites were inhabited more or less permanently all the year round, or perhaps just for seasonal gatherings or something in between. The problem is exacerbated by uncertainties and imprecisions in the chronological phasing of the site's development and by the ancient residents' strange habit of deliberately and periodically burning down some portion of their otherwise substantial houses, reducing them to compressed platforms of incinerated wattle and daub on stone foundations. Extreme opinions exist on either side of this dispute. Some archaeologists find the persistence of human cohabitation unthinkable on such a scale without central organization and a heavy environmental footprint. They imagine Nebelivka as a sort of calcolithic equivalent to the Burning Man Festival, something like that. Others, taking the extreme opposite view, point to evidence of more permanent habitation, including the robustness of Tripilian domestic architecture, elements of fixed infrastructure, such as communal kilns and large ditches, as well as the remains of fixed domestic installations and heavy equipment for food processing, preparation, and storage, not to mention the prevailing economic regime itself, which included a significant component of cereal farming. I'll come back to these questions and arguments in a short while. To put them in context, it's important to stress that Nebelivka is not an isolated case. 
More than 10 of these gigantic sites, each covering an area of more than 100 hectares, have been documented in rural parts of Ukraine and neighboring Moldova, where they date between 4,000 and 3,200 BC. Others are no doubt hidden, or largely hidden, under modern development. Some of these sites, such as Majdanecka and Dobrovody, reached, sites, uh, reached sizes of around 250 hectares, comparable with the largest Mesopotamian cities of the time, while Talyanki, the largest currently known, is thought to have extended over roughly 300 hectares. These huge sites lie within surprisingly easy reach of each other, at a distance of about 10 to 15 kilometers on the open grasslands. Based on a geophysical and geochemical analysis of soils and sediments excavated at the site of Majdanecka, the German archeologist Johannes Müller and his colleagues have recently made an extraordinary, and some might say slightly outrageous claim. Their counterintuitive suggestion is that the forms of agriculture practiced at these giant sites were not only sustainable, but also enhanced processes of soil formation. In other words, at least some component of the famously rich local Chernozem, or black soils, may in fact be anthrosols, a human-produced soil. This audacious theory says that the production of this soil was induced through the presence of the Tripilian settlements. The basic idea, as I understand it, is that the existence and subsequent decay of these large-scale settlements unleashed a biological process, I don't have time to discuss it here in much detail, which resulted in the creation of black soils. If true, then this stands for a much grander claim that the famous Chernozem of Ukraine is in fact an archeological artifact, a result of a city or cities interacting with nature. I think this seems far-fetched. Look at the extensive and the uniform distribution of those soils in the wider region. But let's at least consider some possible implications that would follow if urban life really did generate geological change on this scale, well before what most people in the scientific community consider to be the onset of the Anthropocene. It would mean, remarkably, that at least some parts of what the ancient Greeks came to regard as the barbarian steppe may in fact be rooted, not just historically, but also ecologically, in a lost urban tradition, already long forgotten by the time of Herodotus. The spatial reversal of cultural stereotypes, civilized and barbarian, seems all the more poignant because on current reconstructions, the prehistoric settlements of the Ukrainian steppe forest zone also constitute a temporal reversal of political history presenting traces of a robustly egalitarian tradition of urban life approximately three millennia earlier than what is traditionally thought of as the birth of democracy in ancient Greece. And yet, and yet, the terms city and urban have so far been largely denied to Nebelivka, Talianki, Majdanecka, and other contemporary urban centers of the Tripilia culture. They are referred to in the literature mostly by the nondescript term megasites, 
owing to their lack of conformity with theoretical models of urbanism, which assume the presence of hierarchy and control as core features. This euphemistic treatment highlights the anomalous character of the megasites on a world historical scale and their lack of salience to wider debates over the character and development of human life in cities. And to some extent, I think it's worked. Beyond a small and specialized circle of prehistorians, these sites remain little known, despite a certain amount of recent media coverage. Scholarly justification for this practice of sorting and exclusion among cities and non-cities is presented as technical, couched in terms of abstract scalar models and jargon-freighted theories of social complexity, often resting upon outdated and speculative notions of group psychology. However, in recent years, the scientific objectivity of such procedures has been brought into question through a mass of empirical and theoretical work, some of which is highlighted in my recent book, co-written with the late anthropologist David Graeber, The Dawn of Everything. Some months after the publication of the book, I was approached by the director of forensic architecture, Eyal Weizmann, who in turn had been approached by Anselm Franke, then of the Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin, to take part in a three-day conference called Die Zivilisationsfrage. The civilization question, there it is. We took over the uh, HKW for a few days. This was devoted to a discussion and a critique of our book, The Dawn of Everything. After some time in conversation, it became apparent, to us at least, that despite the radically different scales of analysis, there was a kind of weird intersection between the objectives and the methods of my archaeological collaboration with David and the kind of counter-forensic procedures undertaken by forensic architecture when investigating the complicity of state actors in a wide array of contemporary human rights violations, including, for example, tracing causal links between official state policy, gold mining and violence against indigenous communities in Brazil, extrajudicial killings in Palestine, and the application of illegal techniques of border defense to refugees in the waters of the Eastern Mediterranean. More particularly, we felt, in seeking to undermine the authority of state narratives by extracting counter-archives of forensic information from physical crime scenes, Weizmann's forensic architecture is strangely aligned with our project of finding evidence in the archaeological record to confront established historical narratives which positioned the modern state and its technologies of control as a telos of social and political evolution. We also discovered a spatial correspondence between our agreed focus of attention, the prehistoric site of Nebelivka and its exceptionally rich Chanozem soils, and the sites of recent human rights violations which have already attracted the interest of forensic architecture. <laughs> the equivalent of a crime scene that we now propose to investigate jointly was painted with a much broader brush across multiple continents within a colonial paradigm of archeological fieldwork that for some time now has been under sustained scrutiny by researchers. Its results were perhaps most succinctly expressed by the prehistorian V. Gordon Child, a former director of the Institute up the road where I work, in his seminal 1950 essay for the Town Planning Review called The Urban Revolution, 
which as I discovered some years ago when I was first invited here by uh, Pierre Aureli, uh, is one of the few texts that contemporary architects and students of architecture might have read that, that was written by uh, an archeologist still 70 years after its publication. Now, I'm not gonna rehearse uh, Child's arguments in this paper, which are much too famous now to need any repeating. But I will ask you to reflect for a moment on the images that accompanied the paper, illustrated the paper, and in particular, how the kind of technical procedures involved compare with those which led to the more recent discovery and investigation of the Ukrainian megasites. I would draw your attention in particular to the almost industrial scale of earth removal, illustrated here at the site of Harappa in Pakistan, which precluded the careful investigation of soft building materials, like unbaked mud brick, for example, and indeed often involved the wholesale destruction of more ephemeral layers of architecture. The result was to produce images, images of settlement forms that were to a large degree entirely new creations, compressing multiple historical phases into flat ground plans, illustrated here by the site of Uruk Warka in southern Iraq. And by the way, it's important to note that we still know almost nothing whatsoever about the organization of ordinary households and residential districts at this, one of the earliest cities in uh, Iraq, Mesopotamia, because of the almost exclusive uh, focus of the excavators on its Acropolis and its monumental architecture in the center. Plans like these were then raised into three dimensions through the kind of axonometric reconstructions that were very popular and ubiquitous in publications at the time. In the felicitous terms coined by Jim Scott, this style of urban archeology span made legible, or in some cases actually created, powerful and entirely new images of state surveillance and control, testifying to a causal link between the growth of cities and the growth of stratification, a cogenesis of the city and the state. I say created because many of these reconstructions have since been questioned by archeologists. Some have been rejected in favor of others that argue for the likely existence of open and democratic public spaces as well as robustly egalitarian distributions of housing and resources, or for the coexistence of hierarchical institutions with earlier traditions of collective governance, or indeed for quite fluid temporal reversals and alternations between them. The jury is out, and pretty much everything is contested about the political organization of early cities, whether we're in Yucatan or on the floodplains of southern Iraq. Even within the histories of individual urban sites, we may these days need to take account of multiple urban revolutions, evidence of which can be detected in the archeological record from the pre-Shang city of Tao Se in China's Jinan Basin to the ancient metropolis of Teotihuacan in the Valley of Mexico. And here I'm following a very simple definition of a revolution. It's actually Tolstoy's definition. He said, a revolution is simply a change that occurs in a people's relation to power. As a result of this changing global context, archeological findings from an otherwise unassuming district of rural Ukraine now occupy center stage in a debate over the very meaning of urbanization. Our proposition 
is not really to make the case for cities against the state, but to create a point of reflection for these debates focused on a dynamic visual model of the site of Nebelivka. Among other things, we want to explore how archaeological understandings of the Ukrainian megasites sparking these debates about egalitarian cities, how these understandings could really only emerge as a consequence of new ways of seeing, to, uh, to quote the, uh, the brilliant John Berger book and documentary uh, series from the 1970s. These ways of seeing are generated by new analytical sensibilities, focusing on the archival properties of soil and sediment, a shift of scientific focus that also opens up new kinds of comparison with the growth of early cities in other parts of the world, like Southern Africa, Amazonia, Yucatan, China, Southeast Asia, and more. In each case, the shift from large-scale excavation to the imaging and analysis of soils reveals dramatic evidence. You can pick out the, uh, the contours and the outlines of an extraordinary number of buildings in this image from Ecuador, courtesy of the brilliant archeologist Eduardo Neves. So these are urban landscapes lurking, otherwise unsuspected, beneath the cover of forests and grasslands. It's all pr quite preliminary at the moment, uh, this new collaboration of ours, but our basic idea is to kind of follow the ethos of the ancient megasite builders, to look at how processes of social learning and reasoning are captured in the act of making images and models. In particular, how parametric modeling techniques arising from the study of architecture can enhance the process of archeological interpretation and vice versa. And it's worth recalling here the maybe obvious point that prehistoric archeology span is the art and the science of interpreting evidence without verbal testimony or written testimony. Evidence here refers to material culture, in this case, both the soil and the artifacts. But evidence without testimony is always underdetermined. Or as David Clark famously put it, archeology, span in essence, then, is the discipline with the theory and the practice for the recovery of unobservable hominid behavior patterns from indirect traces in bad samples. Still the best definition of my field from the 1960s. Such traces can open up possibilities, and they can constrain them. And there's always a multiplicity of these extending between data points. But without do you care, the traces themselves can become obscured or even trammeled by top-heavy theoretical constructs or freewheeling speculation. Archaeologists often treat indeterminacy as a caveat to interpretation or as an invitation to patch over the gaps and the silences in the evidence with totalizing theories of social change and scalar change. The approach we want to take is different. By contrast, in the model, which I'm going to try to sh show you here, and I really want to emphasize, this is just a draft. We just got going. There it goes. What we try to do here is really to embrace and then to simulate multiple possibilities in the life and in the growth of a single site, Nebelivka. What you're seeing here is a speed run 
of the pr procedural prototype tool designed by Davide Piscitelli for forensic architecture, where possible distributions and spreads of buildings are generated with attention to the changing status of individual dwellings, the ones which are burnt and the ones which are not burnt, through a set of rules that consider the spatial organization of the site based on its geomagnetic plan. As he describes it, it's kind of a machine for modeling the indeterminacies, modeling the indeterminacies of the data and the possibilities that they introduce, adding parameters as we go along. And one of the next things we'll do, by the way, is feed in the, uh, the chronological, the radiocarbon database more thoroughly into this model. Again, to narrow down the constraints and the, add some more parameters, add some more variables. I see what we're doing here in a way as analogous to what David and I attempted on a much coarser and broader scale in the dawn of everything. There, we surveyed an array of past urban forms and modes of organization in order to query nomothetic approaches to scalar change in human societies. Here, we see how by working within the constraints and the possibilities of a single data set. A multiplicity of possible urban worlds can be shown to coexist at the very same site. Now, of course, only a few of the paths you are seeing will actually have been taken historically. But all of them could have presented themselves to conscious historical actors as viable alternatives in the remote past, perhaps moving us a little way beyond condescending ideas of primitive architecture or vernacular architecture as non-discursive or as symbolic of a static worldview or as merely adapting to its environment. By reversing the figure ground relation of traditional archaeology and museum, museum display, we also want to try and consider what can be learned when the logic of unearthing, the extraction, the cleansing, and the purification of objects from the earth shifts towards this much gentler practice attuned to the texture and the materiality of the earth itself as a primary medium and locus of investigation. In this non-museum, or even anti-museum, no objects would be displayed. Instead, the densities and the textures of the viscous black earth of the Ukrainian steppe would take center stage in a top-down projection creating a kind of archaeological theater with which people can interact. In this theater, which as you can tell, is still only very vaguely conceived in our own heads, relations of surface to depth revealed through subsoil scans would frame a series of competing propositions about the possibilities of human coexistence with the land. In a way, we feel, and this is our motivation for doing it, really, that the stakes are quite high. The standard narrative of state formation rests on a denial that sites such as Nebelivka can, in fact, be considered cities, since acknowledging them as such would demand that we rewrite the history, both of urbanism and of the state. The kind of visual installation that we want to try and construct, its main purpose will be to explore the forms and the strategies taken by this process of denial, this process of negation. In doing so, it would bring to the surface a series of strong claims and highly conservative assumptions about the nature of cities, 
claims that otherwise might remain implicit or obscured by a veneer of pseudoscientific jargon and then expose them to direct questioning. We might frame this as a series of propositions and refutations. Nebelifka cannot be a city. It cannot be a city because it's too small, right? If it's too small, then size matters, yes? It cannot be a city because it's too ephemeral, okay? It's too ephemeral. That means that permanence matters. And it cannot be a city because it lacks complexity. It lacks complexity. So organization matters. Now, rather than trying to present an alternative reconstruction, the model that we have in mind will use visual parameters to interrogate the elements of this pervasive logic. It's a little bit, as Eyal points out to me, along the lines of that famous uh, parable of Sigmund Freud, the one about the neighbor who has to explain why the kettle that they borrowed was returned broken, and who simultaneously deploys not one, but three arguments. The kettle wasn't broken. The kettle was already damaged when I borrowed it, and I never borrowed it in the first place, regardless of the fact that all these arguments are logically incompatible. Now, similarly, I would suggest to you, if size matters, then it matters that Nebelivka covers an absolute area as large as that of contemporaneous sites in Mesopotamia which are routinely identified as cities, despite the fact that we often know far less about ordinary living arrangements within them. Remember the case of uruk -Warka, as I noted earlier, where we still know almost nothing about residential quarters in the earliest phases of what everyone calls a city. If permanence matters, then surely we must compare like with like. Human mobility and seasonal flocks of population sizes undoubtedly were characteristic of Mesopotamian cities too. And since there's never been a city with a totally static or captive population, why would we conjure one up from thin air to compare with Nebelivka? If organization matters, Let's consider the fluid complexity of Nebelivka's economy. How for centuries, almost a thousand years, its inhabitants carefully balanced and syncopated the rhythms of cultivation, harvesting, herding, foraging, and hunting on the steppe forest ecotone. Let's consider its coordinated movements of salt, stone, timber, copper, and pigments of long distances. Let's consider the precociousness of its domestic arts and crafts. And let's also consider the radical simplification of Neolithic ecologies, including hydraulic and arable systems, by later states and empires in regions like Mesopotamia to serve the efficient extraction of energy, resources, and taxable produce, and also their rigid standardization of material culture through centrally administered production. Let's consider all of these things. Now, I, I guess you can see at this point why we're calling the work uh, provisionally Cities Against the State. This is a school of architecture, so you understand architectural evidence. And Almost everything we're talking about here is based on a reading of architectural evidence against the telos of state formation. We want to try and suggest that if one learns to look at such evidence differently, you can see that cities have existed, not merely as incubators for the state, 
but as potential arenas for many other ways of organizing human societies. That people have devised other modes of living together in radical proximity, which allow them to bypass the interests of predatory elites and their technologies of surveillance, domination, and control. But our thesis, thesis is not just a contrarian one. We have another possible title for our work, as you can see even the title is underdetermined at the moment, which is uh, the Nebelivka Hypothesis, which is a much more propositional title. And the proposition is that there have been complex modes of urban existence which conserve the life-giving uh, the life-giving forces of the environment using less and preserving more and that living in a city such as Nebelivka could actually have produced or at least amplified the vitality of the land that it inhabits as it stands, the materials to substantiate this far bolder hypothesis currently lie buried, not within the vaults of the world's great art museums and galleries, but just a few centimeters under a field of sunflowers in central Ukraine. Thank you very much. I think it's it's a uh, terribly exciting uh, this the idea of this exhibition or this interactive if I understood oh. correctly this interactive anthropological uh, exhibit which for me I think was really exciting in the sense that it the theme of the of the uh, lecture series and the kind of workshop as well was how can architects potentially empower others to become their own world builders in a way, their own, imagine different histories, imagine, empower people to become, even in a sense, their own architect. So mm. I love the idea that the, if I understood correctly, the, the exhibition would allow people to actually test multiple different scenarios. Exactly. And, and in a sense, start really opening their mind as well through, through the, interaction with the exhibition somehow so right yeah that, that, that's exactly how we see it yeah mm, it's great yeah yeah should we why don't we take some questions from the audience we have a mic to go around yeah there's one here yeah just ra raise your hand up nice. so, yeah. Hello. Um, thank you for the t thank you for that. This, that was great. Um, forgive me my like artistic training and background, but um, without knowing the social context of the site, there seems to be a clear biological structuring uh, or a similarity to a cell, um, and not a grid cell. Uh, an, uh, oh, an organic cell. Um, I just wondered whether there was any uh, biological investigation into the site, into the organization of the sites. Yeah, uh, there is, and it really focuses on the soil. I mean, bi biological and chemical. I mean, if you want to read the article which I, I put up earlier, it's all about earthworms, actually. <laughs> and the, the way that uh, they hypothesize that the human occupation of these soils actually triggered soil formation processes that otherwise wouldn't have occurred. I think this is going to be a very controversial theory in archaeology. I think it's going to need a lot more data to convince people, but it's out there um, to be discussed. So that there is certainly a strong biological component to all of this. Thank you. Is, is there, I don't know how, how uh, credible this is, but th there's been a, a lot of recent evidence about the Amazon mm. also having been a sort of uh, cultivated That's entirely, right. and even some people going as far as to call it a garden. That's right. 
And um, in fact, my colleague Manuel uh, Arroyo Kelin has worked both in Amazonia on the uh, uh, Terra Pretas and other anthropomorphic, uh, anthropogenic, excuse me, soils um, of that region. And he's also done some work in Ukraine mm. um, with John and Bissica. And people are certainly beginning to think, I think, in a completely different way. Uh, about the uh, the anthropogenic component of soils and sediments. My colleague Liz Graham here, I believe, has done similar work in Belize uh, recently. Uh, it's really changing our whole notion of archaeology and uh, urban archaeology, I think, in, in particular. And you're right, I think uh, Amazonia is the region where a lot of this work was really pioneered, actually, and is now spilling into other parts of the, yeah. the record. It throws up a very challenging question about the distinction between nature and, and the history of... of yeah, I mean, you can't strictly so. make a distinction yeah. anymore in some of these cases. Yeah. Yeah. Should we, can we get the mic here? Here? Question there, question there. Thanks. <clears throat> I understand that you don't entirely accept the thesis, so I'm hesitant to ask you to speak on its behalf. The one about the soil about the formation. Soil. Yeah. I found it exquisite. It, brought, it literally brought a tear to my eye when you said it. Is the contention that it was at any point an intentional process or... or uh, um, that's a good question. And from recollection, they've only published one piece on this, and I've been to... Um, to visit that research group. They're based at the University of Kiel in Germany. Um, I'm not sure how much they formulated an opinion on that question, so I wouldn't really want to speak for them. I want to believe it. I, I can just see some legitimate reservations, um, but it's a hell of an idea. Thank you, I have a question around, well, might be characterized as the, around the production of an ecological image. And I was just curious, um, I was thinking about the conditions of drought uh, that we've we experienced, and there was this kind of um, surfacing of a lot of ar archaeological sites as a consequence of riverbeds drying up, etc. So there is a way in which um, ecological processes themselves mm -hmm. produce an image of the earth and produce images of um, spaces of habitation, etc. So there's a way in which these um, clim climactic processes, one could perhaps argue, are also disclosing a certain kind of x-ray, if you will, of um, forms of habitation, etc. So I think, I thought, well, there's an interesting kind of perhaps analogy to be made once again through a kind of inver inverting the figure mm -hmm, ground mm -hmm, relationship, mm -hmm. but also thinking the, of the earth itself and climactic processes as manufacturing these images of um, human habitation, etc. Wow, that's a really beautiful observation. Thank you. I, I, I yeah, completely uh, agree. Um, it's, uh, it's very provocative, and I'm, I, I am trying to put my mind right around what you have said. But I, I suppose the, the, the question that comes uppermost in my mind is why... Um, okay, Gordon Child was talking about the urban revolution, and then there were many thinkers afterwards, for instance, Fernand Brodel, you know, in his wonderful history of capitalism, who said that uh, the, um, the cities, the idea of the city was predicated on having, that's his word, an empire on the countryside. Now, um, the, the question that comes to, my, to mind listening to you is, do we really need to stick to this idea of the urban? And do we really need to uh, stick to this idea of a city? Could one actually think instead of settlements or villages? Um, and in a way, those questions were raised to some degree in the, six, in the 60s, uh, never in a completely fundamental 
way, but listening to you, looking at the picture of the settlement on the screen, I am in a way struggling, that is from the perspective of an architecture writer, mm -hmm. to actually see those images as a city, and in a way I would find it much more interesting if I didn't need to have recourse to all those things which I already know, for instance, mm -hmm. the plan of Uruk and so on. Yeah, I mean, that, that's obviously completely legitimate, but actually what interests us and what motivates our collaboration uh, is the pushback against the definition of these sites as cities. The explicit rejection of the idea that they could be is actually precisely what interests us. So, sure, I mean, one could do all kinds of other fascinating projects about large-scale, low-density, human whatever, um, but that's not our focus here. Or one Can I just, try to to just a small rejoinder? Uh, what, for you, then, would constitute a city? I mean, you put three ideas on the screen. Um, are, you, are you holding on to these ideas, those three points, which uh, you have put on the screen? Well, as I try to explain, what we're doing, um, rather on the model, as I understand it, of forensic architecture, is trying to unpick the logic from the inside. I don't think necessarily the people arguing these things are doing that for themselves. Uh, a bit like Freud's kettle, you have these actually rather illogical frames of reference that need to be forensically unpicked and analyzed. But in order to do that, you have to bring them to the surface. You can't leave them explicit. And that actually requires a lot of work, a lot of unpicking and a lot of modeling uh, in itself. And that's, that's the idea. That's the project. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I was curious about the miniature houses that you showed. Uh, as architects, we're all like quite familiar with making models. So I just wondered uh, if you want to sort of elaborate on it and and maybe draw some sort of far-fetched ideas for what we can learn from it. Or well, um, they are they are beautiful, lovely objects. Some archaeologists have suggested that they may actually be modeling those. Uh, unusually large structures, which some people think are assembly halls. So there are some reconstructions of those based on the little models. Um, I don't personally know enough about them and their archaeological contexts to really give you much of a, an elaboration uh, on those. Um, but it's, yeah. I mean, the whole, one of the things that drew me to this topic in the first place is how different they are. Um, from the early cities that I'm more familiar with. So my own field work uh, most recently was in Iraq, in Iraqi Kurdistan, where, you know, if you walk over the remains of early cities in that part of the world, um, you're basically treading all the time on, on ancient pottery, commodity containers, and it's incredibly boring stuff when you excavate it and you have to process it because it's incredibly standardized. Uh, actually mass-produced from as far back as 6,000 years ago. They were standardizing uh, commercial vessels and that kind of thing. And one of the things that's so striking to me about these Ukrainian sites is that along with the lack of centralization, you have the preservation of a kind of domestic creative milieu, which is pre-urban in the Middle East. You have to go all the way back to Neolithic villages and things to find a situation like this where, you know, David used to joke, they're, they're like huge artist colonies or something. I mean, every house has got its own thing going on. Every house is inventing its own crockery and finding, a, you know, they're all stylistically related, but you can't find two the same. So there is something, there is a freedom, a freedom of expression there, which is very interesting. And the little models uh, are clearly part of it. And obviously, we're using the term model not purely in an aesthetic sense, but in, in an intellectual sense, as um, you know, people working through possibilities at different scales. Yeah, and I guess the non-standardized site, a standardized wine vessel or whatever, would mean 
makes sense that it's a product, whereas if it, they're all unique, mm -hmm. they become they're not product anymore. Uh, guess, yeah, mm, maybe. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, I have a question. Um, so, as you mentioned, um, this link between the forms of urban dwelling that um, are detectable or that you see and the type of relationship that exists with the surrounding ecosystem and um, potentially an ecosystem enhancing function that the city has. Um, in how far, also in relationship to your book that you wrote with David Graeber, um, and um, the focus on maybe a less rigid form of urban living, a more maybe anarchist form of urban living. Um, what is the, uh, the nature of that relationship between the ability of a city to enhance the ecosystem or um, maybe vice versa, um, a city that is more loosely governed in a more spontaneous way to then enhance the ecosystem. Is, is there a relationship or is this something um, that is well underexplored? And maybe also how could um, yeah, this counter forensic uh, um, form of mm -hmm. investigation show these things, visualize these things and, and make them understandable? Yeah, I mean, th those are all the kinds of questions we're interested in and particularly this idea that you could have a much lighter and more flexible way of occupying the land um, than what we tend to imagine as, as urbanization. Um, I think it's partly simply a matter of getting to the point where these questions become legitimate um, and not constrained by models that come from outside the evidence. So what we've had for decades now in, in my field and I think more broadly in some areas of social science are these... Um, rather dogmatic ideas about scale in human societies, which are oblivious to ecology, um, which are actually oblivious to evidence uh, in many ways. Uh, they come out of very peculiar places. Uh, we looked into it at one point and it was fascinating. These sort of scalar stress models that say, you know, if you have X number of people concentrated in such and such a density, certain things must happen. And the things that must happen are never very nice. You know, it always means putting someone in charge or developing a bureaucracy uh, or other forms of impersonal authority. Um, where do they come from, these ideas? Uh, I mean, partly I think they come from the kind of thing I'm talking about. But actually what we discovered, if you trace them back to their source, it's quite funny actually. They go back to psychological experiments that were done in business corporations, mostly in Canada and North America in the 1950s and 60s. And you know these are published in places like the Journal of Industrial Psychology, the Journal of Management Theory, where you've got psychological experiments being done with groups of employees who are already working in totally hierarchical, big capitalist institutions being asked questions about, so how would you go about making, you know, a how would you go about reaching a decision on this issue? Well, we would organize ourselves into a series of hierarchical, you know, so it's completely circular, because <laughs> obviously they're not gonna know anything different. And the psychology is generations out of date. But these ideas are still, I mean, they're, you know, presumably they've been abandoned in those fields, I hope so at any rate but they're still kicking around in weird areas of, of academic thought, like archaeology. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, while you were presenting, I was thinking about some of the, the arguments that you were presenting or that you were questioning the other arguments, in terms of how some of the work that we do in, in academia is still uh, ethnocentric, or the, the, even if we think about the epistemology of each discipline and how it frames what we consider to be knowledge or not, and I was, those things were coming to my mind. And when we come, you came to the last uh, slide with the three points and about complexity and what we consider complexity and the way that you're explaining in terms of 
they cultivated. And I was thinking that it's quite complex. Mm -hmm. uh, so those mm -hmm. things were coming to my mind. But at the same time, I was wondering what would be the impact of considering that place a city? Because mm. I don't know if you explained already, if not, uh, Please. Yeah, I think yes. I think the stakes are really high, as I said. You know, I, I think it, it challenges a, a certain canon of values uh, around what is possible uh, uh, in cities. Uh, how is it possible? And 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 it challenges um, certain genealogies, which always come up when I when I'm lucky enough to talk to architects. They always talk about you know the kind of genealogies that students learn back to Greek temples and sort of funny little mud huts. I mean, what would happen if we incorporated this stuff yeah. from the beginning of the, uh, the teaching process? You know, that's, that's kind of interesting, no? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, and I think, I mean, a question that's coming up for me from all of these questions is where is the limits of the city? Where are the limits? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about the soil? Are we talking about the landscape beyond? And then, of course, the consequence, I think, would be that somewhere like Uruk, would, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. should we no longer call that a city on the flip side? No? Yeah, it's amazing what they so, get away with there. I mean, we literally know nothing about how many people there were, what the houses were like, but everyone calls that a city. But you call Nebelivka a city and everyone freaks out. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, just two kind of follow-up questions there. The first on scale, you mentioned that there were assemblies distributed across the city, and I was just wondering at what sort of scale that um, it says that those kind of subgroups are organizing in. And then also just thinking about like the reflection onto the cities we live in now, and mm -hmm. if hierarchy is kind of hardwired into the architecture and the organizing of cities, is, is there any hope for us for a different form of organizing in our current um, structuring and design of the places we live? Yeah, they've, they've got pretty accurate um, estimates for what each of these districts that have been reconstructed, um, you know, the, they can do that by taking a, an average number of people who would have lived in one of these dwellings. All of those numbers have been modeled and you'll, you'll find them uh, in the literature. And that is one reconstruction. It's not the only reconstruction. And we don't want to put all our eggs in the basket of one reconstruction, we want to try and model the competing reconstructions. But in the process of doing that, hopefully, um, it does raise these much more contemporary questions. But I want to emphasize, it's not about finding models in the past for contemporary problems. Uh, in the same way that, that my book with David doesn't do that, it never does that. We're never looking back into the past for answers to contemporary problems. That's a misunder or a misreading of the book. Uh, what it's showing you rather is that people at different historical junctures, under conditions which have been deemed uh, 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 to constrain human behavior in very specific ways, actually are not constrained in those particular ways. Um, so in thinking through those things, um, it's actually the, it, it turns the ambiguities of the evidence into a virtue. It generate, the idea is to generate thinking about possibilities, which are contemporary, you know, they, they do have a bearing on contemporary issues, but obviously to actually put that into practice, one would have to look at the specificities uh, of a given situation in its present context. Thank, uh, hi, uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, this is maybe a bit of a tangent to what we were talking about before, but I was just wondering, do you know if there are any mechanisms in place for preserving these sites that are uh, currently undergoing investigation but are located in a conflict zone? Because I, I find it so, uh, it's an interesting situation that the, the tension of of this ongoing violent destruction mm. of Ukrainian cities overlaid with this, uh, the self-induced decay of, th of the settlement. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering if you know what's going on now. Yeah, thank you. My understanding is that this area has not been heavily shelled. 
and isn't being heavily shelled at, at, at the moment. But actually, if you were to go there, um, the sites themselves are not, as I understand it, at direct risk. We're not talking about standing buildings. Most of it is revealed by these uh, uh, geomagnetic and other uh, subsoil prospection. So it's still under the earth. I mean, the, the amount that has actually been excavated is minimal. Um, so, it, yeah, um, the, there's no, as I understand it, you know, there's no cataclysm, cataclysmic imminent threat to the existence of the site. just wondering what happened next because you say they're all fourth millennium so what happened yeah. I mean do they all disappear at the same time well, what, yeah there, I mean there, there's a lot of speculation about this and it's not um, it's not well understood at all there was a, a claim at one point by the uh, Danish prehistorian Christian Christiansen that uh, they had uh, some genetic evidence for plague the earliest uh, incidents of plague um, from some of these sites. And the idea being that if humans congregate with animals uh, and other, other organisms on such a scale for the first time, sooner or later you're going to have some kind of pandemic or epidemic catastrophe. Um, that doesn't seem to be true. My understanding is that, that, that there have been some serious questions raised about the, uh, the biological side of that argument. So we're, we're actually left with a problem with the disappearance of these sites, where the people went. There's no evidence for any huge violent uh, conflict um, or, or, or uh, abandonment. Um, what happens in practice in, in terms of the archaeological record is that you get the beginning of that mound building tradition and what are called locally the kurgan, uh, these earthen mounds covering burials of men and women uh, with rather fancy uh, individual grave goods uh, and all the rest of it. Um, much more mobile, um, non-urban populations. That's what you see concretely but it doesn't give us a clear answer to where all the people went or why the whole phenomenon petered out after something like eight centuries, nearly a thousand years. So we don't know. I don't know. Maybe we should take one or two more. Maybe they just got bored of it. I mean, <laughs> a thousand years is a long time. <laughs> If I ask one more, um, I mean, I I want to come back to this question about the city or how we describe settlements, and <clears throat> and of course I do appreciate that you are an archaeologist. You are not a planner. You are not an architect. I do appreciate also that you stress that. Um, we shouldn't look at this settlement as a model for the future. I, I accept this. Um, at the same time, you also referred to possibilities, that the whole point of doing this study is actually to expose possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I suppose my question to you then, if, if not you, then who? will actually express those possibilities. She will, because she just put her hand. <laughs> no, I was actually thinking through, I mean, first, thank you for this. It has been incredible to hear you, uh, to hear you speak and also understand where is this work gonna go. So it's incredibly exciting. Um, Partly because it's really, f I'm trained as an architect, uh, so uh, it's kind of challenges to a certain degree. Cert uh, this idea that cities, and er in order to recognize something as urban, it has to be neat. You know, it has to have straighter lines, you know, the pottery mm. has to be finer. Mm. And then if the pottery is finer, there is some development. And then that means urban versus, you know, the, uh, and 
actually, we, and so actually there is this kind of a really weird relationship that architecture has in historiography where as a, as a city, as a condensation of the process of some knowledge formations versus city as a site of a knowledge formations that then influence right. the rest of the organization of territory. Uh, and I think that this is a really something that I've been thinking alongside your pre present presentation because I think that's one of the things that are at stake in what you are challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, and then really space like through material or space reading certain things as more developed, quote unquote, versus less developed, in which actually some of the things that we see in the standardized cities today. Are, are the skilled forms of knowledge mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of their standardized, which kind of real, and I, so I basically I'm not, there is nothing I'm gonna say and that that is yeah. actually opening up and maybe not even a question, but mm. I just realized, has anybody read in the recent, I only read it, 50, I read it 15 years ago, so can't remember, but has anybody in the room read Economies of the Cities by Jane Jacobs, which is this yeah, really course. weird book by Jane Jacobs. Yeah, yeah. Which architect? Which kind of architects really? New obsidian. Uh, new obsidian. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because I think that new, that that I, I when I was reading that book 15 years ago, I was still a student. I didn't know what to do with this book because it mm -hmm. made so much logic mm -hmm. what she was saying. Yeah. And it actually made so much logic to think about, for example, the critique of why is the crisis of Manhattan today? Because of course there is just monoculture, there is just finance. How can the only people who are in finance mm -hmm, actually mm -hmm. find the new ways of, yeah. So I guess you read it. So was this something that you encountered and yeah, how? Because it, was it, my, really it was my teacher's favorite book or one of his favorite books when I was an archeology span student was, was that Jane Jacobs book. And actually in our book, we re revisit Chatal Huyuk, which was the basis for that, that sort of semi-imaginary Neolithic uh, urban center. Yeah, I mean, the, the point you raise is really fundamental, which, uh, as I read it, is really about conscious experimentation and the way that that's been written out or just considered crazy or impossible outside certain very, very restricted circumstances. Like, it's almost as if you've got to have an institute like this in order to do it, whereas actually people have been doing it in an extraordinary variety of ways in other institutional contexts. Okay, then maybe I have a question. Mm. Because I think that the question is about self-actualization. Mm. If we use the term that, like for example, Yane Beta Samaki Simpson, like Nishanbeck scholar uses, I guess, and the way I understand what she writes about self-actualization mm -hmm. in the, uh, is what we would in the Western tradition call subjectivation. Mm -hmm. So is this something in a way mm. that then you are thinking with when you're also these kind of forms of modeling yeah, it's you're doing. It's absolutely crucial because it gets you out of these totalizing models where you know, you've know you got this fantasy that, the, the, I mean, they're all fantasies. The idea that there was ever a city where everyone stayed in one place, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of crazy ideas. And if we just sort of turn that switch off that makes us look for these things and say, well, yeah, there is indeterminacy. And within that indeterminacy, um, there are a range of, of possibilities, which would also have been uh, uh, um, simultaneously available to actors in the past. Um, and, and just thinking differently, thinking in that way, um, I think also changes the way that we think about history and, and think about the connection between the past and the present. Um, it's just a different style of thinking about these things, and it does seem to be generated partly by new techniques. Uh, it's not purely a, you know, a, a philosophical turn or an intellectual which, turn. Which, which is last, last time, I know I'm doing the horrible thing of fogging a mic, but, uh, but then, then it's actually this kind of material aspect becomes really important, because it's not mm -hmm. necessarily that the thought is in front of the material organization, but the spa spatial organization, but that actually the spatial organization and the kind right. of burning and stuff is actually what, in a way, also generates the new forms of organization and the new forms of self like Yeah, awful, uh, actual the, the burning is a real puzzle, and I've yet to read anything um, that really satisfies me about what was going on there, but we could leave it at that. Are, Maybe, are you yeah. aware of the chain house burning patterns in Japan? In ancient Japan, there's a, there's no. a series. So there's a, it's called chain burning. Uh -huh. There's a series of remains once per year 
of a house so that, that it appears that there was a ritual burning of the city or the small settlement, I don't want to use the word city carefully, uh, of the settlement every year and, it, and somehow they shifted slightly and they also said that the, the scales would somehow reset after every year. Sometimes they would get bigger and then they would go back to a... Wow. Uh, yeah, so... Okay, thank you. I'm going to report that back yeah. to my colleagues immediately. <laughs> 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 this, I think this is what they've been looking for for about 10 years now. Great, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> okay, I think, we have to, I think we have to wrap it up. Thank you so much, it was great. Yeah. Thanks for the discussion.